Hello and welcome. This is the Nutritionist webinar. I am Marianne Fessenden from AMTS. Today we are joined by Dr. Jennifer Van Os, an assistant professor and extension specialist in animal welfare on the faculty of the Department of Dairy Science at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Dr. Van Os received her PhD in the Interdisciplinary Animal Behavior Graduate Program at the University of California, Davis, and conducted postdoctoral research in the Animal Welfare Program at the University of British Columbia. The research in her lab at UW-Madison focuses on understanding, evaluating, and improving the welfare of dairy animals from a biological perspective. Today, Jennifer will talk about managing heat stress to improve the welfare of dairy cows and calves. Please now enjoy Dr. Venos's presentation, which was pre-recorded. Jennifer and our co-hosts join us for two live question and answer sessions, the recordings of which are appended to at the end of this presentation. Hi everyone, I'm Jennifer Van Oss, and I'd like to thank you for joining me today as we discuss managing heat stress to improve the welfare of dairy cows and calves. First, I'll start by setting the stage for what I mean when we discuss animal welfare. So oftentimes we talk about animal care, which are the various inputs that then affect animal welfare. So these inputs include the housing and facilities we provide, our management and our direct handling of the animals. And these factors combine to contribute to the outcome of animal welfare. Animal welfare refers to the state an animal is in and what they experience objectively. So an animal's welfare can range on a spectrum from poor to good, depending on the context or somewhere in between. So the emphasis of my talk will be on the animal welfare outcomes relating to heat stress. Heat stress is an important issue that affects the entire dairy industry. And it's both an economic and animal welfare concern that's becoming ever more prominent over time. So managing heat stress is a critical issue for the long-term viability of the dairy industry. In the US, it's estimated that costs relating to heat stress add up to approximately 850 million to up to $1.5 billion annually. But these estimates are several years old and now the economic impacts are likely more. And this is because high producing lactating cows are the most vulnerable to heat stress because of the metabolic heat they produce and per cow production levels have continued to increase over time. In addition, climate change models predict an increase in average temperatures in the coming decades, as well as more frequent heat waves, meaning the conditions that cause heat stress are likely to become ever more frequent in the future. So first I'd like to review the processes of heat exchange, which will set the stage for some concepts I'll talk about later on for managing heat stress. So cows, like other mammals, are homeotherms, meaning that they maintain their body temperatures within a narrow range under normal circumstances to perform various bodily functions. To maintain body temperature, they have to balance the heat they gain from their environment by releasing body heat back to the environment. And cows show a progression of different mechanisms to release excess body heat and to avoid gaining extra body heat. So it's a process of heat exchange. So what I'm going to show here is a diagram without units for the progression of body temperature from normal to elevated. So normal body temperature for cows is generally within the range of 38 to 39.3 degrees. So the line I'm showing here represents body temperature maintained within the normal range. When cows begin to experience heat stress, over time, they may be unable to maintain normal body temperature within this range. So we see core body temperature begin to rise. Eventually, if body temperature rises above normal, we begin to see negative production effects, such as reduced milk production, as well as impaired fertility. And ultimately, if body temperature continues to rise, cows can even experience death in extreme cases. So cattle have a variety of mechanisms for reducing metabolic heat production. 
So this includes a reduction in physical and muscular activity during heat stress because these things produce body heat. So this manifests as decreased general activity levels and that includes the expression of estrus behavior, which is in part what affects fertility during heat stress. In addition, the processes of feeding and digestion, particularly for ruminants, generates considerable body heat. For lactating cows, it has been estimated that they produce at least twice as much body heat when they are lactating compared to when they are not. And so when cows experience heat stress, we see a reduction in dry matter intake, reduced milk yield, and impaired reproductive ability. And these can actually be considered adaptive responses that cows employ to restore, restore their thermal balance. Cows also dissipate heat back to their environment, and there's two different categories of heat loss. So the first category is what is called sensible heat loss mechanisms or non-evaporative heat loss. So one mechanism is that cows conduct heat from the core of their body to the surface of their body through their tissues. There are also processes of convection through blood movement, as well as through vasodilation, allowing more heat to escape from the skin surface. Cows also lose heat through convection in terms of air movement in their surroundings. And they can also conduct heat away from their bodies through direct contact with a cooler surface when they lie down. These mechanisms are called sensible because they occur in proportion to the temperature gradient between the cow and her surroundings. And this means that the rate of heat loss is reduced in warmer surrounding ambient conditions. In contrast with sensible mechanisms, there are also latent heat dissipation mechanisms. So this is evaporative cooling. And what we see is that water is converted from a liquid to a vapor form using energy that either comes from the animal herself or from her surroundings. Latent heat loss does not depend on a temperature gradient between the cow and her surroundings. So the different mechanisms that cows use that include evaporative cooling include increased respiration rate, which can escalate into panting, as well as sweating. When a cow's skin temperature increases because of warm ambient environments, this stimulates the peripheral thermal receptors in her skin. And this triggers these nat natural evaporative cooling responses, including these elevated respiration rates, panting, and sweating. Because these evaporative processes cause cows to lose moisture, cows then need to drink more water during heat stress. And so we see behavioral changes, both for reducing um, heat gain as well as for dissipating heat when cows experience heat stress. So to reduce heat gain from the environment, cows will seek out sources of shade. And to dissipate heat, they will drink more water to replenish this moisture loss, and they will also spend more time near sources of water. So you will see groups of cows bunching near a water source, even if they aren't drinking. And sometimes you'll see cows attempt to splash themselves or even wallow. And it's theorized that cows are attracted to the cooler microclimate near bodies of water. In terms of behavioral changes reflecting cows' attempts to cope with heat stress, we also see changes in their time budgets and lying time. Under normal or thermoneutral circumstances, cows are highly motivated to spend approximately half of their day lying down, and lying time is a common indicator of cow comfort. But across many studies, we've seen that daily lying time decreases when cows are heat stressed. So there is one example graph shown here, and on the x-axis is the ambient air temperature in degrees Fahrenheit, and on the y-axis is average daily lying time. And what you can see is a linear pattern where total lying time decreases as air temperature increases. And this pattern is seen across several studies. The reason that it's thought that cows spend less time lying down is because when cows stand up, this exposes more of their skin surface area to promote convective heat loss. It's also theorized that in a standing posture, this increases the efficiency of respiration. So studies have found that the reduction in total day, 
daily lying time is driven by a change in the pattern of lying and standing. So what this graph shows is the patterns of lying and standing, as well as the ambient temperature humidity index in the red, core body temperature in the thick black line, and respiration rate with the black circles. So when a cow is standing up, the orange bar is at 100, and when the cow is lying down, the orange bar is at zero. And what this graph illustrates is that while a cow is lying down, so the orange bar is at zero, we begin to see both respiration rate and core body temperature increase over time. And then when the cow stands up, where the orange bar is at 100, you can see that then body temperature begins to fall along with respiration rate. The reason that this effect on lying time matters is because lying is a basic behavior that's important to cattle. It's something they're highly motivated to do, and increased standing time is a risk factor for lameness. So this graph demonstrates a time series of ambient temperature humidity index and the rate of claw lesions in a herd across five years. So this graph is from Dr. Nigel Cook from the School of Veterinary Medicine here at UW-Madison. And what you can observe is a two-month lag time between ambient temperature humidity index and the rate of claw lesions, showing that the increased standing that happens when cows are in heat stress then results in a delayed increase in claw lesions. So because of the effects of heat stress directly and with a delay on cow welfare and productivity, it is often important to provide supplemental heat abatement. For high producing dairy cows, the intrinsic mechanisms for dissipating heat and preventing heat gain that we just discussed are often insufficient to help them coat and maintain good welfare and production levels. In the US, 94% of dairy farms provide at least one form of supplemental heat abatement. And this can include shade structures to limit the gain of heat and things such as fans or water spray to help cows dissipate heat. So now we will discuss how these heat abatement me mechanisms work and some recommendations for how to implement them. So the number one defense against heat stress is shade. And depending on the dairy's production system, this is either something that is included by default if cows are housed in a barn, or in other production systems, shade is not yet ubiquitous. But shade is absolutely critical to prevent cows from gaining additional heat. Shade seeking is part of the natural behavioral repertoire of cattle. So if we look at their natural history and evolutionary ancestors, shade seeking is something that is intrinsic to their behavior. And more recent studies have shown that cattle highly value access to shade. So preference studies have shown that cows prefer shade compared to being in the sun, and they even prefer shade to soakers that aren't shaded. Other studies have shown that cows are highly motivated to access shade and they will choose it compared to other resources or behaviors that they're usually highly motivated to engage with. When shade is lacking, then other resources for dissipating heat, such as fans and soakers, will have limited effectiveness because this will be counteracted by the process of gaining heat from solar radiation. So providing shade prevents cows from gaining additional heat and then other resources can further cool cows and help them dissipate heat. So this cannot be overemphasized too much. Shade is absolutely critical. Other heat abatement resources include water soaking and fans. And all of these resources require an initial capital investment when they're installed. And then fans and water spray also have ongoing energy and water costs that shade structures do not. So decisions have to be made about when to act activate these resources. There are clear economic benefits to providing heat abatement in terms of maintaining production levels, reproductive efficiency, and cow survival in extreme heat stress circumstances. So these economic benefits are clear. 
but my work is done to increase animal welfare. And so within this context, if we're thinking about optimizing the experience of the animal, then it is important to intervene as early as possible before obvious production problems appear. And this is because if you remember the cascade of natural coping responses to heat stress, the other behavioral and physiological changes that occur are earlier indicators that the cow is experiencing discomfort and production problems happen later in this cascade when problems have already set in. In our industry, it's common for people to discuss environmental indexes to represent heat stress. So one of the most common is the temperature humidity index or THI. Of course, there are other indexes as well, but this is very well known. The temperature humidity index combines ambient air temperature as well as relative humidity into an index to indicate different levels of environmental conditions that are conducive to heat stress. And many studies over the years have aimed to identify breakpoints or thresholds of temperature humidity index based on responses in cow's core body temperature, when milk production changes, somatic cell count, or mortality. So most often a threshold of 72 or more recently 68 are used to represent when cows experience heat stress. And the reason I put this in quotes is because there are several limitations to using environmental thresholds to represent the animal's experience. So some of these limitations are described here. First of all, oftentimes a single sensor is placed in a barn to activate cooling systems. And oftentimes these don't even incorporate humidity, they're just based on ambient temperature. And even if they do incorporate humidity, a single sensor does not capture the variety of microclimates the cows experience in their pens, in their stalls, and at the heights where they stand or lie down. In addition, there are other environmental factors that are important for heat exchange in addition to temperature and relative humidity. So these include air or wind speed, solar radiation or black globe temperature, which is a temperature measurement that incorporates solar radiation. So these factors are also important and they aren't considered in this simple index. Even more importantly, cows have individual variation. So they often experience discomfort and seek cooling even in conditions that we describe as thermoneutral. So this can be below the THI thresholds of 72 or 68, which are based primarily on production losses. And we see evidence from animal welfare studies where cows voluntarily use soakers overnight even when ambient temperatures have cooled down. So this shows that there can be a lag where they're still experiencing discomfort even when ambient conditions wouldn't indicate that. They've also shown a preference for using soakers early in the morning before the daily ambient temperature humidity index begins to peak. So again, they're using cooling before environmental conditions would suggest that we've reached this threshold for production losses. And likewise, even on days that are relatively mild overall, in terms of average THI or air temperature, cows have shown this preference for seeking out cooling. In addition, using a single threshold can't represent the varied experience of individual animals because animal welfare is at the individual level. And so cows can experience different levels of heat stress even within the same environment. So I'd like to review a framework for discussing heat stress. And it's common that people discuss heat stress in terms of the ambient conditions. For example, an upper critical temperature in terms of ambient air temperature, which relates to the idea of thermoneutrality, or it can be discussed in terms of internal metabolic heat production or changes in milk production. In the last 50 years, many researchers have equated thermal comfort experienced by the animal with thermal neutrality and have defined heat stress as occurring above the upper critical temperature or else when production losses begin to appear. And many of these thermal indexes such as THI have been developed from models describing the relationship between environmental conditions and such cattle responses. So typically this focuses on changes in production.
But what I want to return to is this concept that animal welfare describes the animal's state and subjective experience. So it is important to ask, what is the animal experiencing and what does that mean in terms of animal welfare? So reviewing some of these definitions, homeothermy discussed at the beginning of this talk is specific to changes in core body temperature. So when body temperature is maintained within the normal range, cows are homeothermic versus when body temperature falls below normal, they are hypothermic or when body temperature is above normal, they are hyperthermic. And so in this diagram, that's the blue sections of the graph and the blue line represents body temperature. Thermoneutrality is a specific narrower range of conditions and that's represented by the green box on this diagram. And so this is the range of ambient conditions between a lower critical ambient temperature and an upper critical ambient temperature when internal metabolic heat production remains stable. So this is represented by the orange line on the graph. So the thermoneutral zone is narrower than the homeothermic zone in terms of ambient conditions. Outside of the thermoneutral zone, metabolic heat production can either decrease or increase in, a, in an attempt to help the cow maintain its internal biological processes. But then thermal comfort is an even narrower concept. And so this is defined as the range of conditions in which the cow's natural physiological and behavioral defense mechanisms are not activated. So these defense mechanisms begin to activate before changes in metabolic heat production or changes in body temperature occur because these mechanisms are enacted in order to try to maintain these other pro processes. So these processes include vasodilation, sweating, increased respiration rate, panting, and the behaviors we describe that either reduce heat gain from solar radiation or improve heat dissipation back to the environment, as well as behaviors to reduce metabolic heat production. So I want to emphasize here that when cows are experiencing thermal discomfort, this is a threat to animal welfare and that they can experience this discomfort even before we observe changes in body temperature and before we reach the upper critical temperature that would affect metabolic heat production. So these are natural behavioral and physiological defense mechanisms that are activated to prevent those other changes. And once we see these changes occur, then we conclude the cow is already experiencing subjective heat stress and a threat to their welfare. So as I mentioned earlier, it's important to consider that individual cows have different individual subjective experiences and their welfare can vary even on the same farm. So different farms vary in their facilities and management, which are the inputs of animal care that affect welfare outcomes. But even within the same environment, individual cows can respond differently, depending on their breed, their level of production, their pregnancy status or health status, as well as their coat characteristics, such as the percentage of black color or their hair coat type. This can also be affected by their social status. So for example, a more dominant animal could have better access to drinking water, cooler microclimates within their pens, as well as better access to heat abatement resources. So it's important to remember that not every cows will respond exactly the same, even within a single farm. And so it's important to adjust cooling strategies within a farm by observing those cows in their environment. One of the indicators that can be used to identify severe heat stress is panting. So this is a conspicuous indicator. It's easy to recognize and it's a clear sign that cows are experiencing heat stress. So several signs of heat stress include drooling, cows breathing with their mouths open or breathing with their tongues protruding or some combination of these three signs. And once cows are exhibiting any of these signs, this is typically associated with an elevated respiration rate. So on average, 100 breaths per minute compared to lower respiration rates when cows aren't exhibiting any of the, these signs. So this is a very easy sign to identify when walking through a barn, but ideally a more sensitive indicator that occurs earlier on in the cascade of responses to heat stress would be better to use so that we can intervene earlier. <laughs> 
So a suggested earlier indicator is to measure respiration rate. And because respiration rate is a continuous variable, establishing a precise cutoff is challenging, but I think that 60 breaths per minute is a good rule of thumb. And this is based on several pieces of evidence. So firstly, when cows have 24 hour free choice access to cooling resources, they have respiration rates of about 50 breaths per minute on average. In contrast, when cows do not have consistent access to cooling and they're deprived for a period and then offered the opportunity to use soakers, they began to show a preference for these soakers once their respiration rates reached 60 breaths per minute. This also corresponded to the temperature humidity index of 68 in a tunnel ventilated barn with evaporative cooling pads in another study. And the same threshold has been suggested as a good rule of thumb in older literature. Lastly, it's easy to count. So 60 breaths per minute is one breath per second. So if a cow is taking an inhalation and exhalation faster than a count of one 1,000, then that's an indicator that she's breathing faster than 60 breaths per minute. So this is what I suggest as just a general rule of thumb. This graph illustrates how respiration rate changes in ambient conditions. So these are data collected from individual cows on a farm in California across a range of ambient conditions. And what we see is uh, initially in cooler ambient conditions, cows naturally show a range of respiration rates. So not all cows in the herd are breathing at the same rate. And the red dashed line shows 60 breaths per minute. And we can see that as ambient conditions become warmer, the variation also increases, but more and more cows have a respiration rate above 60 breaths per minute. And we also measured body temperature in this study and saw that at 60 breaths per minute, some cows showed a core body temperature already elevated above normal. As more cows began breathing faster and faster in warmer conditions, we saw that more cows had elevated body temperatures, including above a threshold that would be defined as the clinical fever. And what we can see is that the most extreme conditions, all cows are now breathing above 60 breaths per minute and in fact above 80 breaths per minute. So this shows the progression of this response in warmer conditions and suggests that if we look at when just a few cows begin breathing faster than 60 breaths per minute, this gives us a clue as to when we could intervene to prevent more and more cows from exceeding that threshold. In terms of measuring respiration rate, studies have shown that this measure should be recorded at least every 90 minutes or more frequently. And that allows for tracking the changes in cows' responses in order to fine tune the heat abatement that's provided. And this should be done during the peak heat of day, depending on the region. So this could start mid-morning and continue into the late afternoon to see if the adjustments to heat abatement is provided, whether respiration rates go back down, showing a cooling response. So now to discuss some of these heat abatement mechanisms, this talk will primarily focus on water-based cooling. So first some definitions, because these terms are sometimes used interchangeably, but when we describe misters or foggers, I specifically am referring to high pressure devices that inject the air with fine droplets of water. So when I say misters, I'm referring to the resources that others refer to as foggers. So the way that these function is that these fine droplets of water evaporate and this results in, redu in a reduction of air temperature in the microclimate near the cows. So this provides indirect cooling by cooling the microclimate and then cows breathe in this cooler air. This type of strategy works well in climates with lower relative humidity because this evaporation increases the relative humidity and therefore lowers the air temperature. When the relative humidity is already higher, in, in, for example, in climates in the US Southeast, then the air already has less capacity for water to evaporate. There's a reduced water vapor gradient, and that means that there's less potential to generate this latent heat loss. So even though it's not dependent on the air temperature gradient between the cow and the surrounding air, it is dependent on this water vapor gradient. 
In contrast, when I'm describing soakers, sprinklers, or showers, I'm referring to devices that emit low pressure spray that results in mostly coarse droplets that land directly on the cow. So again, misters refer to high pressure, low, small droplet spray, whereas soakers refer to these low pressure, large droplet sp spray patterns. It is important to note that all spray nozzles output a range of droplet sizes. So that means that even soakers emit some small droplets. And these smaller droplets function similarly to how misters would. And these smaller droplets evaporate in the air before landing directly on the cows. So this means that soakers also cool the microclimate just as misters do. And that's what's illustrated in this graph on the right, where you can see the microclimate temperature in a control treatment with no soakers, and then in a sprinkler treatment with soakers, where now the air temperature is reduced by having soakers turned on. In addition to cooling the microclimate similar to misters, soakers, sprinklers, or showers deliver mostly coarse droplets that directly wet cows. And when cows are wet directly, the energy from their body heat evaporates the water. So not just the energy from the surrounding air. And the cooling effect is enhanced when combined with high speed air. So this could be from natural wind or from fans which provide forced air. What I'm illustrating in these photos is that soaking can happen in a variety of locations. So on the left, we have feed line soakers. So that's a common location to cool cows so that while they're feeding, the spray lands on their backs. In the center photo, we can see the holding area for a milking parlor, and it's also common to soak cows there as they're waiting to be milked. And you can also see fans which force air over the cows' backs after they're wetted. On the far right, we have cows being showered directly in the milking parlor while they're being milked. And so this is an alternative location where producers could control how much their cows are sprayed while they're in this environment during milking. And the photo on the top illustrates a cow after receiving this type of soaking, where the green regions indicate cooler temperatures than the red regions. In studies with discrete sessions for spraying, similar to in the holding pen or in the parlor itself, we have found that this discrete spraying session results in a significant reduction in core body temperature. And this cooling effect can last even for several hours after the spray, depending on the circumstances. So in this particular drawing, the, in this particular experiment, the graph is showing that the spray occurred during a one hour session, which is shaded in blue. And then in the two lower lines, this was with high volume water spray. And you can see that body temperature fell during that cooling session and stayed suppressed relative to baseline for a while afterwards. Well, whereas when less water was used or no water at all, body temperature increased during that time and stayed elevated. Likewise, with feed line soaking, we also find significant reductions in body temperature. So with feed line soakers, the spray typically happens cyclically where the water turns on and off throughout the course of the day, often not over 24 hour periods, but rather activated with a temperature threshold. So in the study shown in this graph, spray was offered over 24 hour periods. The dash line represents normal body temperature or the threshold above which would be considered hyperthermy. And the blue box indicates where cows voluntarily used soakers. And so they started using them in the morning and this kept their body temperature suppressed throughout the day. So the red line indicates core body temperature when cows only had access to shade and not soakers. And it showed a circadian pattern where body temperature became elevated in the late afternoon and then reached a low overnight. Whereas when cows had access to both shade and soakers, body temperature stayed in the normal range throughout the day. This pattern can also be seen across different ambient conditions. And so here summarized at the 24 hour level, again, we see a dashed line for the upper limit of normal body temperature. And then we have three lines for a control treatment with only shade and then two different sprinkler treatments with different amounts of water. And then 
average core body temperature on these different days. So when cows did not have access to soakers, then on the warmest days, their average body temperature exceeded normal. Whereas when they had access to soakers, this kept their body temperature in the normal range, even on the hottest days. So many studies have demonstrated similar effects on keeping body temperature suppressed as well as maintaining production. And so models of US production losses from heat stress have estimated that these losses could be $1.5 billion a year or more when calves are provided with only shade, which is important for combating heat gain, but these economic losses are greatly reduced if soakers are provided. So across studies, soakers have been shown to improve both feeding time and dry matter intake during conditions of heat stress and have also improved milk yield, restoring them to close to normal, even in warm conditions. An additional benefit of soakers, which has not been discussed as commonly, is that these may help to deter insects and flies. So besides cooling cows, soakers have been shown to reduce behaviors that are associated with fly avoidance in cows. And this is presumably because the water itself deters the insects from landing on the cows. So when cows are standing under soakers, they show fewer of these insect avoidance behaviors such as tail flicks, hoof stamps, and skin twitches. So this is an additional benefit besides cooling. In some regions, there is a concern about soaker use, which is the water footprint, because most dairies typically soak their cows using potable water. And the amount that farms use varies widely. So water footprint is a sustainability concern for much of our industry. And the recommendations for how much water to use for soaking cows can vary greatly. So there are many existing recommendations, but it they need to be backed up by empirical research. And until quite recently, evidence was lacking from peer-reviewed studies done on live, cattles in live cattle. And instead, more research was focused on heat exchange models. So the first question about soaking recommendations is how often should cows be soaked? And studies have found that the coat typically takes somewhere between 14 to 16 minutes to completely dry after being sprayed, regardless of how much the cows are soaked. But fast, uh, drying occurs faster under warmer or windier conditions. So in higher ambient temp temperatures or with higher wind or air speeds, then cows will dry faster, which means that they should be soaked more frequently under those conditions. So therefore, as a minimum recommendation, cows should be sprayed every 15 minutes or more frequently to provide them with consistent cooling throughout the day in hot weather. A second question is how much water to apply with each spray. So there are common rules of thumb very similar to this one, indicating that the proper degree of wetting cattle is to thoroughly soak their backs, but to not allow excess water to run off their sides. And earlier research that had been done on the right amount of water to apply used models and simulations, and there were very few studies on live cattle to evaluate the effect of different amounts of soaking on their behavioral and physiological responses, indicating heat stress. So the reason that this type of recommendation had come about was because it was really focused on only applying enough water to provide for evaporation. And this is because latent or evaporative heat loss does not rely on a temperature gradient between the cow and her environment. So the focus was on wetting the cow and then turning off the water so that evaporation could occur after the water was turned off and as the coat begins to dry. And I will return to this point momentarily. Another reason that recommendations have often indicated that water should not drip off the cow's sides is because many people have speculated that excess water would be associated with the risk for mastitis. It is important to note, however, that no studies have found a direct link between the practice of soaking cows and mastitis. Instead, we see that somatic cell score and mastitis incidents are both higher overall in the summer season, regardless of what kind of heat abatement is used. In 
a recent study, I will share some preliminary data with you, where we wanted to evaluate whether water actually drips onto the teats when cows are soaked from above. So we collected data in the milking parlor, which meant that we could score the back of the cow's udders. So on the right, you can see a photograph as well as an infrared photograph of the same cow after she's been soaked in the parlor. And what you can see on the photo on the left is that there was water dripping down the cow's legs. So those are the green areas, but her udder remained completely dry. So we looked for any signs of wetness on the backs of the udders, both before and after the cows were sprayed. And what we found was that after the cows were sprayed, four out of five had no signs of wetness on the udder at all. And then out of the udders that did get wet, we used these photos to classify the patterns of water. So for example, in the three photos in the top row, Sometimes there was a smear of water, and this was because the tail switch became wet, and when the cow swished her tail, she left some moisture on the udder. Sometimes there were drips of water, but they ended or dripped off not, and did not land on the teeth. So that's what you can see in the other two photos in the top row. We were only able to identify water that could reach the top of the milking cup in 2% of total observations. So this is just some preliminary evidence, but it suggests that the risk of water actually reaching the teats is quite low. In contrast, other studies have found that water dripping off the cow's sides does actually contribute to cooling. So the water sprayed on cows is typically cooler than the skin temperature. And because of this gradient, the water dripping from the body also removes heat. And what we've seen in various studies is extremely rapid reductions in both skin temperature and respiration rate after a single brief spray application. And that body temperature also responds quite quickly. And then after a single 10 to 12 minute session of spraying before the coat even began drying, body temperature was already reduced. And this demonstrates that the cooling contributions of processes such as fluid convection and a cooler microclimate should not be discounted. And I want to emphasize this point because oftentimes in the literature, there's a lot of focus placed on thermodynamics and heat exchange. But that assumption treats cows as inanimate objects with a goal of cooling them down to a set temperature. And in that case, it is true that latent cooling or evaporation contributes the greatest amount to removing heat from an object. But cows are biological systems, and when we talk about their welfare, their subjective experience of discomfort also matters. And again, the peripheral receptors are what perceive this experience of heat stress, and this is what triggers this cascade of responses. So rapid reductions in skin temperature, respiration rate, and even core body temperature can be achieved using mechanisms other than evaporation. And so these mechanisms shouldn't be discounted, even if they aren't the primary contributors to actually reducing the temperature of the object, in this case the cow, they are important from a biological perspective. And for this reason, soaking cows to the point where water is dripping off their sides is actually beneficial. Another common myth relates to droplet size. So in the literature, there is a popularly repeated mantra that small droplets should be avoided. And this has come in a few forms. So some um, documents have indicated that small droplets could rest on the top of the hair in form some kind of insulating barrier, trapping a layer of air and heat, and that this could actually exacerbate heat stress. But digging into the chain of literature to see where this originated, I think this is actually a misinterpretation because when droplets land on the tips of the hair, this means that they're evaporating using heat from the surrounding air temperature rather than from the cow's skin or body. And this means that this generates less cooling than when the heat is transferred directly from the skin surface. And this is why large droplets that actually reach through the hair coat to the skin are most effective for cooling the cow. But this doesn't mean that small droplets are actually counterproductive to cooling. And again, all nozzles emit a range of droplet sizes, and those small droplets can be beneficial for cooling the microclimate and causing evaporation as well. Thank <laughs> you.
In one study, we directly evaluated droplet size. So we controlled for the flow rate that the nozzles output while varying the average droplet size. And we found there was no difference in cooling in either direction when we controlled for the amount of water. The take home message from this point of the talk is that when we're making decisions about how much water to use to cool cows, the goal is to use the water efficiently. So what this means is that if we're balancing our goals of helping cows cope with the heat effectively and the amount of water that we're using, we want to make sure that enough water is applied to generate effective cooling. If too little water is applied, this is ineffective and therefore is not an efficient use of water. At the same time, after a certain point, continuing to apply more water leads to diminishing returns for cooling. And so it's important to balance these concerns. In lower humidity climates where both soaking and misting are effective, if using soaking, you also achieve some of this evaporation in the air and, cools, and cooling the microclimate. In this type of climate, what we've discovered is an optimal volume is approximately 3.0 liters per spray application. And when this is done at the feed bunk, each spray application can cool two to three adjacent cows at the feed bunk. This should be applied at least four to five times per hour with a maximum time of 15 minutes between sprays. And the frequency should be increased in warmer or windier conditions. So these recommendations will need to be adjusted based on the region, the climate, as well as the responses of cows on specific farms. One problem for water use efficiency is that on many farms, the soakers run on a timer cycle even when cows aren't present. So what I'm illustrating in the photo on the left is cows on a dry lot dairy in the western US and you can see in the foreground that the soakers at the feed bunk are activated but the cows are all in the lying area of the corral standing or lying under the shade and so the soakers will continue to activate based on a timer even if the cows aren't present. A potential solution to save water in this type of scenario is to use more advanced technology to sense when cows are present and only activate the spray when they're there. So a commercial example of this would be the cool scent system by Edstrom. So here it's illustrated at the exit of a parlor where it activates when cows walk through and not when there are no cows present. So these types of devices are slowly being released commercially and have become more accessible, although price can still be an issue. Another consideration is the com combination of cooling resources. So even with soakers activated on a timer, one way to improve the use of soakers by cows is to provide shade where the soakers are located. And as I mentioned earlier, shade enhances cooling by preventing heat gain, not only to the cows themselves, but also the water pipes. And this allows for cooler water temperature and a greater gradient between the water and the cow. Studies have found that when cows have a trade-off, so they're forced to choose between shade or soaker, such as in this photo, they prefer the shade. And so that means that if a cooling resource, such as a soaker, is unshaded, cows' use of this resource will be much more variable because they prefer shade. In other studies, when cows did not face this trade-off, so for example, if the feed bunk is shaded, then they showed a clear preference for having soakers compared to not having soakers, as long as these resources are combined. So these graphs just illustrate this concept. So in the control treatment on the left, cows were provided with only shade, and the hours per day shows how long they spent in the feed bunk area. And when they were provided with soakers in addition to shade, they spent more time in that area taking advantage of the cooling on those hotter days. So they were getting cooling benefits from standing at the feed bunk. And likewise, in the right, it's showing the percent preference for a feed bunk with soakers compared to one without. So 50% would represent chance or the cows using both equally and not having a choice. And then you can see that the dots are above that line and that the magnitude of that preference increased on warmer days. Another alternative potentially for saving water would be conductive cooling beds. So several research studies have investigated installing chilled pipes under the cow's lying area to recirculate 
chilled water. And this would conduct heat away from the cows when they lie down on the cooled beds. In some of these studies, there's evidence of reduced heat stress, such as lowered body temperature, when these cooling beds are provided. But right now, these are only experimental, and they need assessment in the real world, including economic assessment. Another challenge with these cooling beds is that they do not restore lying time, and neither do soakers. So at the beginning of my talk, I discussed how cows spend more time standing and less time lying in warm weather. And even when these cooled beds are provided, cows do not spend more time lying in them comparing to when they're not heat stressed. And likewise, when soakers are provided, even though they're effective for reducing body temperature, improving feed intake, improving milk production, etc., cows do not spend more time lying down. Instead, when there are soakers available, cows spend more time standing at the feed bunk, both feeding and standing without feeding. So in the graph on the right, what you can see is the number of minutes during the different hours of the day that cows spent standing at the feed bunk when they only had shade, which is the gray bars, or when there were soakers installed at the feed bunk, which is the blue bars. So cows spent substantially more time standing even if they weren't feeding. And this can be an issue because increased standing, particularly standing on concrete and when there's wet flooring, such as when the area has been soaked, are all risk factors for lameness. One thing that we are currently investigating with a PhD student in my lab, Kim Reuscher, along with Dr. Nigel Cook, is how high speed air over the lying area affects lying time, with the idea that higher speed air may take advantage of cow's natural behavior for seeking out cooling and promote better lying times. In addition to cooling lactating cows, it's important to remember the other age groups on the farm. So there has been a growing body of evidence that heat stress in dry cows affects their own future productivity, fertility, and immune function, as well as the performance, health, and survival of future generations. And that these effects carry over not only to the gestating calf, but future generations as well. Cooling resources such as soakers and fans have been found to mitigate these negative effects and recent economic models have indicated that providing heat abatement to dry cows is in fact profitable as well as important for their welfare. For heifers and pre weaned calves, shade is also recommended as an important resource. So ideally, if possible, a shade structure blocking at least 80% of UV light would be provided on top of hutches if calves are housed outdoors or shade from trees in addition to the hutches themselves. In terms of other types of cooling, there has been less research to date on the welfare benefits of cooling young cattle. There was one study that evaluated soakers provided to 10 month old beef steers that had no previous experience with this type of cooling resource. And this study found that they, like lactating cows, preferred feed bunks with soakers compared to feed bunks without, especially when ambient conditions were warmer. And based on this type of evidence, we predict that young dairy calves would probably also seek out cooling. In our lab, my PhD student Kim Reuscher has been investigating ventilation in calves housed in outdoor hutches. So the concept is that when calves are inside of a hutch, they can be releasing body heat into that enclosed environment, which can potentially exacerbate heat hutch heat stress inside of the hutch. Depending on the type of hutch, the hutch itself can provide shade, or if it's somewhat translucent, it could result in a greenhouse effect where the hutch also accumulates a warmer ambient temperature. With pair house calves, this could potentially be exacerbated with more than one calf spending time inside of a hutch. So with the increase in popularity in pair and group housing, we wanted to investigate these various factors as well as potential solutions for reducing heat stress in calves, such as providing hutch ventilation. So the photo on the right illustrates a ventilation kit that can be installed in pre-existing hutches that provides airflow towards the base of the hutch and opening the bedding door also provides additional airflow 
In a study we conducted last summer, we had 32 pair house calves. And so they had access to two hutches. And during part of the day, we restricted the calves to each of four conditions for one hour at a time, repeatedly over different days. At all other times of the day, the two calves in each pair had free access to both hutches. So calves were placed inside of either the ventilated hutch or a non-ventilated hutch, either by themselves or with both calves inside of the same hutch. Our preliminary results showed that ventilating the hutches reduced their signs of heat stress. So the graphs I'm showing here reflect change in respiration rate after the calves spent one hour inside a hutch. So negative numbers on the y-axis indicate that respiration rate went down over time or calves got cooler whereas the positive number means that respiration rate increased or calves got hotter. There was an interaction between the age of the calves, the number of calves in the hutch, and the presence of hutch ventilation. Overall, we found that ventilating the hutch indeed significantly reduced respiration rate, regardless of the age of the calves before weaning. In addition to evaluating their signs of heat stress, we also evaluated the calves' behavior. So over 24-hour periods outside of the restriction periods, we evaluated their preferences and how much time they spent inside of each hutch using time-lapse cameras. The subset of data here is preliminary data on 20 of the pairs of calves, and we found that they showed a significant preference to spend time in the ventilated hutch, and they spent over two-thirds of their time during the peak heat of the day from noon to 5 p.m. inside of the ventilated hutch instead of the non-ventilated hutch. The graph on the bottom expands the preference out across these 20 pairs, and the dashed line represents 50% or chance, meaning the calves spent equal time in both hutches. And the blue bars illustrate the time spent in the ventilated hutch, whereas orange indicates the time spent in the non-ventilated hutch. So what you can see is at the individual pair level, most pairs showed the preference that was found at the group level. In conclusion, I will leave you with a few take-home points. So the first take home point is that when we discuss heat stress, many people use different definitions, but from an animal welfare perspective, it's important to remember that the cows or calves experience of thermal discomfort begins well before production problems appear. And for this reason, it's important to intervene early at the first signs of behavioral or physiological changes, indicating that the animal's attempting to cope with this thermal discomfort. Ideally, all age classes of cattle on the farm should have some form of heat abatement. At minimum, this should be providing them with some kind of shade, which helps prevent heat gain. And in addition to that, heat can be dissipated by combining soaking with fans to promote airflow and convection. To generate effective cooling, enough water should be used. Otherwise, the water isn't being used efficiently. And in order to calibrate how to provide these resources on any given farm, the best practice is to observe the animals themselves, such as observing panting or ideally respiration rate as an early indicator, rather than just measuring aspects of the environment, such as ambient air temperature or temperature humidity index. What I'd like to leave you with is that welfare is the state and subjective experience of an animal, and this can range from poor to good to somewhere in between. Reducing heat stress by providing cooling resources is not a welfare enhancement. This is a basic expectation to bring animals from a state of poor welfare to a state where they're not suffering from poor welfare. This is not a way to provide, again, enhanced welfare. It's just a basic expectation, and it's very important to intervene as soon as possible. I welcome your questions as well as feedback outside of this webinar time. You can email me at jvanosk at wisc.edu or follow me on Twitter. And I look forward to discussing this topic with you further. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, for that presentation. We will get to the questions in a minute. First, let me introduce next month's speaker and thank my co-hosts and webinar sponsors. Next month, we'll be joined by Dr. Tom Taluki, the CEO of AMTS. In case you did not know Tom, he received his BS, Master's, and PhD from Cornell University, where he worked with moving the CNCPS forward. When he left Cornell, he, Caroline Rasmussen, and 
VJ Durbal formed Agricultural Modeling and Training Systems in 2005. Since then, Tom continues to directly contribute to the model. He has not yet given me a topic for the presentation, not surprising. So I'm calling it Whatever Tom Wants to Talk About, also not surprising. It should be a great chance to pick his brain since you've not been able to see him at meetings and trainings. As he has said multiple times, this is the longest he has been home in 17 years, and it is a mixed blessing. Join us for the presentation, followed by question and answer sessions twice on September 10th. The presentation will start at 9 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time and 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. As you know, these webinars take a lot of work and cooperation. The webinars are organized and produced by AMTS, USA, and Global. This afternoon, we are joined by our longtime collaborator, Paula Torillo of IFINA, who hosts the series as El Webinar del Nutritionista. She receives support from Guillermo Lerman, Technol, Rock River Lab in Argentina, Biotur, and Conicar. She has the excellent translation skills of Paula Alanis backing her up. We also thank AMTS distributors. This afternoon, we are joined by Sean Lee of AnsiTech in China, from Brazil, Marcelo Hens Ramos, director of 3R Lab, and in Russia, Vadim Bektebnikov of Nova Lab. This morning, we were joined by our Italian distributor, Elena Bonfante of Dairy Innovations Italia, and her partner, Bill Prokop of Dairy Innovations. We also have questions from Marcos Neves Piera of Universidade Federales de Lavras in Brazil in the afternoon session. Marcos makes a point of sending thoughtful questions in the months he is unable to join. We are especially thankful to generous sponsors who make it possible for us to get great speakers and manage the program. We thank our gold sponsors, Arm & Hammer, Animal Health, makers of cattle feed ingredients that optimize dairy cow health, and the Canola Council of Canada. Learn more about feeding canola at canolamazing.com. Our silver sponsors are Ajinomoto Heartland, superior nutrition through amino acids, makers of Agipro L, Dairy Land Laboratories, and Virtus, makers of Strata with EPA, DHA, Omega-3s, and Prequil with Omega-6s. Our bronze sponsors are Dairy One Forage Laboratory, Amino Max, Adiseo, Purdue Agribusiness, PMI, and Soychlor. Each of these companies support education and research worldwide. We hope that you will consider them in your formulation decisions. Following are the recorded question and answer periods from both the morning and afternoon session. Remember, you can find this webinar and our additional The Nutritionist webinars as well as other webinars through AMTS's Vimeo site or AMTS on YouTube. We've also converted several of our webinars to podcasts. Those can be found on our website under the podcast tab, or you can find them in iTunes under the Nutritionist Podcast. We start in the morning presentation in which Elena Bonfante of Dairy Innovations Italia and Bill Prokop of Dairy Innovations joined us. I will. If, Elena, do you have something to say? You want me to start? I prefer. I have questions, but I can wait after you. So I'll start with a comment, if that's okay. Um, I want to applaud you for a great presentation. And um, I think that the emphasis that veterinarians and other you know, dairy professionals have got to learn from this and similar research is so often our teaching has been in a very linear fashion. And animal welfare, to me, as a concept, has been a linear process. And, and you're touching upon the fact that really we need a systems thinking approach to all of these things to understand the unintended consequences. And when I discuss this with my clients, I prefer to use the term animal well-being as if to say animal welfare is the standard by which we said, well, this is the minimum that she needs in order to, for us to be good stewards. But in fact, if she had the choice, what would she want to do? And that's what I use the category of animal well-being. And I applaud you for, you know, touching upon the difference between animal welfare as, as just sort of the, the minimum where we have to go. Yeah, thank you for that comment. And I've heard the terms used interchangeably sometimes. And to me, animal welfare, it does occur on a spectrum. So you can have poor welfare or good welfare. So I think what you're describing as well-being, I would interpret as 
good welfare and sometimes other people refer to that as good quality of life or a life worth living but I think it's important to emphasize we want to do more than the bare minimum and that it's important, as you said, to think about these unintended consequences. Oftentimes, we're emphasizing intervening to prevent these production problems, but what the animal's experiencing can occur before those problems manifest, and it's important to consider how that's affecting her. Uh, yeah, thank you, Bill and Jennifer. Um, I do want to, I want to mention, I think Bill's had a good amount of experience in this. I remember going through the, um, creating some educational slides on the model, and he helped me quite a bit in the environmental um, part of this. So I appreciate having him here today and, and working with us on this. Um, I'm going to ask a quick question, and then we'll, we'll go to some from Elena. Um, so one of the questions is, is the ventilation in the hutches forced air or natural air floor flow? And I'm going to add to that and to say, if it's just natural air flow, flow is there any plan to do um, a study with the addition of forced air? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that question. So in the particular experiment that we conducted, it is just natural ventilation and natural air exchange. There has been very little research on cooling calves, especially with airflow. And unfortunately, I don't have the figures right in front of me, but we did measure air speeds inside of the hutches where there was just the front door open versus those ventilation windows plus the bedding door. And surprisingly, the air speeds weren't that high, yet the calves showed that preference. There was that effect on the respiration rate and even where they were lying in the hutch. They tended to lie with their noses right against those windows. We do not have plans to conduct a study with forced air, but I know that there was a recent study at the University of Florida that should be published soon where they provided fans to group house calves and were also looking at how this affected heat stress and where they laid in the pens. And so I don't have information from them on what kind of air speeds they were generating, but I think it does demonstrate that the animal's behavior isn't random. So the patterns of behavior that we see in adult cows, it makes sense that even as they're developing calves, that we can see this behavior where they do prefer to lie where there is more airflow, but I think a lot more research needs to be done. In those pair housed calves, do you see um, effects of lay into, I'm wondering about these calves over here that seem to lie in the sun <laughs> or the non-ventilated hutch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and so we're still working through the data. Actually, what I showed here was just a subset during the hottest part of days on 20 calves. We actually had 32 pairs and we collected data across multiple weeks of life over 24 hour periods, but it's just a bit time consuming. So within pairs, we didn't necessarily classify dominance. We did look at competition during milk feeding times. And what we found was actually there was very little competition. And we are hoping to classify how much time the calves chose to spend together. So there was one previous study in Canada where they classified how much time the calves spent inside the hutch, outside the hutch, and how much of that time was together. And they found that about half of their time was spent inside of a hutch, and within that half of the time, 80% was spent together. So I think that that actually reiterates why um, this maybe isn't the ideal way to pair house calves, but it is a feasible option for people to get their toes wet with calf pairing, but because the calves choose to spend a lot of time together, this was actually why we were worried about heat stress since um, two bodies would be inside one hutch. Okay, thank you. Um, Elena, would you like to ask some of your questions? Thank you, Marianne. Thank you, Jennifer, for the great presentation. And I think the timing is uh, correct now. <laughs> I'm in Italy and, uh, you know, we are experiencing a lot of heat stress now. So um, my question is related with the, um, the beddings, uh, the stalls. Uh, um, you were mentioning the cooled mattresses uh, before. Mm -hmm. uh, so here in Italy, they are not very used or common. And so we have different kind of beddings. Uh, do you have uh, data or experience uh, uh, of uh, which is the best during summertime uh, for the stalls, like uh, sand uh, uh, compared to straw, there is any difference uh, in animal behavior preferences? Mm. If any. <laughs> 
Um, off the top of my head, I don't know about seasonally, but just in general, cows have shown a stronger preference for sand compared to other bedding types and that inorganic bedding is associated with better somatic cell counts. Mm -hmm. So I think for that reason in the summer when mastitis incidence is higher, that just adds an additional case for sand if that's possible. Obviously other types of bedding are acceptable and people can be successful with those. But in general, cows have shown a stronger preference for sand. Okay, but nothing related with the heat dissipation, uh, you don't have data about that? No, and instead okay. what we found is that lying time decreases in warmer mm -hmm. weather, and that seems to be regardless of the lying surface and regardless of whether there are soakers present. But actually, since I recorded this webinar, we have collected some preliminary data from this summer, and we think we are seeing a significant difference in lying time when there are higher air speeds. So compared to when it's just natural ventilation, when we add fans over the stalls, we're seeing about a 45 minute difference in line time on average. And that's not mm -hmm. even considering on hotter days that magnitude may be greater. Okay. Another question. Um, so here in Italy, we have some production that uh, has to, you know, uh, follow some specific rules like Parmigiano Reggiano, and they can milk, um, you know, I'm talking about the 2x, so they milk uh, twice a day. And uh, there are farms uh, where the soakers are um, only present in the milking parlor, for example, not, mm -hmm. not in the um, feed um, alley. And so I was wondering, uh, or in your opinion, do you think, uh, you know, to drive the cows in the milking, uh, you know, in the waiting area uh, a third time during the day, maybe, you know, in the middle of the day will be helpful? Uh, uh, even if uh, it's gonna probably decrease, uh, you know, their resting time mm. a little bit? Can, can it be beneficial? I think the answer, unfortunately, is it depends. So there are farms who have done that. There are actually older studies that look at this targeted cooling and using the holding pen multiple times a day. My worry would be this decrease in lying time. So mm -hmm. if I visited that farm, I would want to measure how much time the cows are currently spending lying down. And I would also want to measure indicators like respiration rate and body temperature if possible, because it could be that you can generate enough cooling with fans or other strategies that I would not want to further sacrifice lying time and mm -hmm. force the cows to stand and go to another area of the barn. So it depends on whether that additional cooling would actually be necessary. So we have farms around here that do use parlor cooling and they already milk three times a day. And we found that their ventilation systems were enough that that additional cooling was beneficial, but the cows were coping pretty well outside of those times. And so in that kind of situation, I would not recommend that they add another cooling session because that would be at the expense of lying time. So unfortunately mm -hmm. there's not a one size fits all answer. Oh. Okay, Thank you. Uh, Eleanor, one last time. One? Okay. One, one, last, uh, one last question. It's about the, you know, so, soaker activation during night time. Do you think mm -hmm. it's uh, really, you know, important based upon the behavior, how many cows, uh, you know, would be standing uh, in the feeding alley? Have you, do you have any data about it? Yeah, and, and so if water use is not a concern, we do have evidence that cows will take advantage of cooling at night. We know that there is this lag where the ambient air, air temperature or THI begins to decrease, but body temperature is still elevated and cows will take advantage of that, especially if the farm adjusts their feeding strategy as some do in the summer to allow for this nighttime feeding when the air temperature is lower. And so if the resources are available, if you're not as concerned about water use, that is something that the cows will take advantage of, maybe not to the same extent as during the peak heat of the day, but we know that there is this lag where nighttime cooling can be beneficial. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Thank you. Can I add something here, Jennifer? Absolutely. So I want to agree with what you said about air movement. <clears throat> I just recently retired from the Cornell University managing that facility, the research area, and, this, and we may we were able to put in enough fans there that we had a six mile an hour breeze continuously across those cows everywhere. And in fact, to the point where the soaking wasn't a priority for those cows, they, they, they didn't seek it, but they, they did use the stalls and the stalls were, you know, again, adhering to the, the best research that most of it came out of the University of Wisconsin to make sure they were comfortable because 
if we don't, if we create wind shadow by cows perching or not utilizing the stalls effectively, we defeat everything, right? And right. so I did a study in 2003 for the late John Smith, and they never published the data, but at the time I was managing four 3,000 cow units, two of which were um, tunnel ventilated it was through cool cells, and we captured data at all different points to show at to what extent the cooling fell off without supplemental fans in the barn. And it led to us installing fans on top of the, uh, uh, the natural ventilate, the, uh, tunnel ventilation that was there, which was proposed mm -hmm. to be enough because the cows just didn't get enough cooling when they were lying down and they ended up perching more. So, right, exactly. Right. And I think you're highlighting the importance to make sure that the, the air is actually reaching the cow. So we're not just Absolutely. looking at air exchange at the barn level, but actually targeting that high speed air to the height that the cows are at. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Bill, for, for that comment. Um, with regards to the positioning of the soaker hoses at the, the feeding bunk, um, what are, are there unintended consequences to feed quality? Hmm. I think that there are concerns sometimes for the spray drifting into the feed. And I don't think I touched upon that because there's been this older debate about droplet size and the idea that smaller droplets um, are not as good as larger droplets. And to an extent, I agree. I don't think that it's counterproductive. It's just not as um, effective. But another reason to use larger droplets is to reduce this drift of moisture into the feed, um, which we know can affect the intakes as well. And so I think that we need to make sure that the feet, the water line is mounted low enough that you aren't having the nozzle so far away that now there's more drift, but at the same time, the cows shouldn't be able to reach them because they will chew on the nozzles. So there, there is a little bit of tweaking that needs to be done to get the right height. Um, thank, thank you. Uh, with the do you have any comments on cooling ponds, the risks versus the rewards? Mm. <laughs> yeah, so when we talk about natural behavior, obviously cows will take advantage of it. You know, they, they would love to wallow, but I think a lot of producers aren't comfortable with that because of the risk to milk quality. So it, a lot of times there are trade-offs when we're talking about animal welfare versus uh, animal health in some aspects or environmental quality and and I think that that's an example of one of them where yeah I think the cows would greatly enjoy that but that might not be the best for for utter health and as well as for environmental quality. Okay thank you. Um, I've been doing a little bit of, of research uh, like a ter term paper type research as my husband termed it. Um, I've been writing a few articles on the environmental effects of, um, of cattle and, and their, green, their carbon footprint. You touched a little bit upon the water usage um, for cooling. Do you know, do some of those the data that, that puts X number of, of gallons of water on, on milk production on cattle, um, are they incorporating cooling water or is it strictly intake? I actually don't know the answer to that. And I think part of the challenge is that it's hard to know how much farms are using for cooling. And so I have gathered limited data from a couple papers and the answer is that water use for cooling is highly variable. And there's not a lot of data on how much water farms are using for that purpose. And some are actually recycling water, whereas others are using potable water. So it, it's a bit hard to quantify. So I'm actually not sure of the answer there. Okay. Th thank you. Thank you. That's just, I think water is the next topic. I, I've, <laughs> I looked at greenhouse gases. I looked at the use of byproducts and, and water is sort of my next subject. Yeah, on the I have an older graph. Unfortunately, I didn't include it in this presentation comparing um, the amount of water that cows drink, the amount of water that's used for soaking and the few studies that have quantified it. And then the amount of water that's used for other purposes. And the largest water use is things like cleaning the parlor, whereas the amount of water that cows drink or the amount of water that's used for soaking is a lot less, but in, especially in areas with a drought. So when I was a graduate student at UC Davis collecting a lot of these data, we were unfortunately in a six year drought. So at that time, really every drop counts. And, and so I think it really depends on your region and the resource limitations of where you are. Okay, oh yes, yes. So thank you. Um, let's see, 
Bill, do you, Bill and Elena, I'm, I'm looking at my questions and I am out. Um, do you or Elena have any further questions or comments? Bill, you go first or do you want me to? No, go ahead. So the, I wanted to emphasize something that you showed there um, as new technology, the, the idea of using um, pulsed water on the exit side of the parlor, for instance, for really soaking the cows. We developed our own back in 2003 at the, those dairies I was working on, and I encourage clients to consider that the payback on these units is not determined yet, but it's got to be worth every penny um, because the cows went back totally cooled off and dry matter intake improves virtually immediately. And so um, all the benefits that you highlighted there, you know, I, I think can't be overemphasized. And it's mm -hmm. a great way to control the use of a pulse of several gallons of water. And I think the cows enjoyed it. Yeah. So, and there, there's been a little bit of studies about this idea of the voluntary cooling, kind of like what you alluded to. I know University of Kentucky, maybe last summer or the summer before, adapted this technology and actually put it in the pen. Um, but I agree with you that if you put it at some place like the exit lane, you don't get cows who become kind of addicted and right. <laughs> use more water than, than you want. And, and I know that they are adapting this technology for the feed line as well. And there's more universities looking at targeted cooling in the pen using similar kind of technology and hopefully that is becoming more and more economically feasible. Actually here in Italy there is a farm that have used or you know installed those sensors in the feeding area you know so yeah they are being more sensitive also to water usage and and also you know to reduce in order to reduce the costs of course. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, because the, the, one of the costs of water is not just the availability, but dealing with the fact that you have an effluent surge now exactly. that you to get rid of, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Yep. So yeah. that's a very real cost to any manager or owner. Exactly. Um, so another factor here that I think needs to be looked at, and it's anecdotal, but I don't think there's any research on it, is the fact that the type of bedding is, may have more impact than we realize not from the body contact, but from how much gets thrown around and incorporated into the the hide, into the, the hair coat. Hmm. Because the, at the Cornell facility, we the only sand that was available to us was basically what I call confectioner sugar, you know, quality sand, <laughs> very fine. And it was wonderful, the cows loved it. But anytime I had to clip a cow for surgery, which fortunately was very seldom, um, other than elective, the, the amount of sand entrapped in that hair coat was astronomical. I mean, to the mm -hmm. point where you had to bathe her before you clipped her. Otherwise, you destroy the clippers. And I'm wondering, in that instance, how much that worked against the water cooling the cow, because if you didn't wash all that sand out, you weren't actually getting to the skin right away. Mm -hmm. uh, you, were, you were creating a layer of, if you will, I'm I'm envisioning this, a micro layer of mud, you know, uh, um, of sand percolating w with water percolating around it, but not necessarily soaking down into the skin the way you would expect if it was just clean air. And I don't know if that had an effect or not, but it would be interesting to sort of to, to look at the coats and see how much is trapped in different environmental settings. And it may only have been in this case. You know, I've not, I haven't done a study or anything like that, but it made me very aware of the fact that my girls were sand laden, okay? Hmm. And so, for what it's worth. Yeah, they're, they're dust bathing. <laughs> well, basically, they, and you didn't see it, but it was happening, okay? Huh. In other words, it, it, was, it was just, you know, in, in the, the course of them, lying and using the bed. I mean, sure, they, they throw stuff around, but usually it's more feed. And flies was not an issue because with a six mile an hour breeze, a fly couldn't survive in there. Mm -hmm. there was, it was impossible for them to land. They just got swept out. Mm, yeah, and so, I, don't, I don't actually know the conductive properties there. That, that's an interesting phenomenon. Yeah, so anyway, I tossed it out there as an observation. And I, at the time, it, I recognize it, but the more I'm thinking about it now in terms of heat stress, because my girls typically didn't 
care about the water. And I just said, well, maybe it's because the the air is moving so fast. But mm-hmm. maybe it was a combination of the fact that they weren't getting the benefits of the water. Or maybe it was making things worse. I, I, not quantitative, okay? Um, because the milk production did not drop in during the, the uh, warmest days to the point where you'd say, oh, these cows are really heat stressed. So the, there was enough air moving that I felt cocky or comfortable that mm-hmm. we had it under control because to, to lose more than three or four pounds of milk was rare. Okay, so they did well. And I think your observation about the fact that the cows would stand or the fans rather than the soakers is very interesting because I like the idea of understanding the cow's natural history and her natural behavior and working with that rather than against it. So we have found in many studies that cows will voluntarily use soakers they'll learn to, but that their first instinct is to seek shade and to seek the the high speed air. And so that's why in our more recent studies, we're really trying to take advantage of that to promote lying time. So it, it actually doesn't surprise me that that's what you observed. And it sounds like your strategy of that really high speed air was working well. Yeah. And I, I encourage it, but again, the limitation in some, on many dairies now is not just the cost, but also the availability of the electricity to support the fans. Because in many cases, the grid will not allow them to have any more than they have. And um, so that's a limitation, obviously. But again, um, for all the reasons you said, the feed getting wet, um, you know, the perceived risk of mastitis from the soaking, but just any time you throw water around in a barn, it, there's problems that we create. It's just as in the parlor if it's used wantonly, okay, without, you know, um, purpose and direction. So it's one of those things that I w- it was gratifying to see that the air seemed to to be the primary um, driving force, no pun intended, Mm -hmm. that kept those (laughs) girls comfortable. So anyway, no science there, just an observation. You should run a study, Bill. Yeah, (laughs) at at Bologna. Of course. course. All right, well, um, for lack of any more questions, Elena, do you have any? No. Um, All right, terrific. Elena, always wonderful of you to join. Uh, I appreciate profoundly the the thoughts you bring from an Italian perspective. You have some Thank different you. things that you're dealing with there. And Bill, like it or not, I think you are just, you're going to become a, a standard panelist now. So <laughs> thank you always for your contribution. And we will now finish with the question and answer session from the afternoon with Paula Torillo from Argentina. Now I'm going to open up the floor for questions. Um, I do have the slides up so that if we need to have um, specific slides that we move to, then I can do so. Um, in the meantime, I'm gonna say hello, Dr. Van Os. Hello, Paula. Hello, Paula. So if you want to go ahead and unmute yourselves and greet, um, Paula, do you want me to go first with questions or would you like to? Uh, whatever you want. I, I I don't have a preference. Hi, Jennifer. Nice Hi. to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thanks for having me. We did we did have many. I had lots of responses this morning, by the way, Jennifer, to say what an excellent webinar. And um, Marcelo also said, good webinar, and then left. So <laughs> I think Thank it's you. appreciated. Yeah. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. All right. Um, Paula, why don't you go ahead while I queue up some of the questions that I have. Okay. From, um, oh, gosh. I have to find the ones from Marcos. Uh, great. I, I have a couple of questions, but uh, let's go with the first one. Uh, it's from Gustavo Torres. How much time is there between the maximum air temperature of the day and the cow reaction in her body temperature? And how much time needs the cow to lower her temperature after soaking her? Mm, okay, that, that's a really great set of questions. And actually, Marianne, I did have a slide showing the delay between ambient yes. temperature and body temperature. Okay, can you? Yes, pause. I, I think okay. it's around 34 or 35. 
34. Yeah. So this is just from one study and this is in California conditions, so a Mediterranean climate. And what this slide shows is that when cows don't have soakers, there is this characteristic circadian pattern that's a bit more pronounced um, under periods of heat stress. So you can see that as the time of day is going on, body temperature peaks towards the evening, but actually the peak heat of the day is earlier. So the ambient temperature begins to rise in the morning and peaks a few hours before body temperature does. And that relates to the second part of the question um, somewhat, which is that this illustrates why nighttime cooling can also be important because it does take a while for body temperature to come back down, um, even when cows do have cooling. And so there can be this lag depending on the type of cooling system you're using, especially if there aren't soakers. So with soakers, that effect on body temperature is much quicker. And that's actually what's shown in that previous graph. So slide 33, that's from a different experiment. And with this experiment, it was more similar to holding pen soaking. So instead of intermittent soaker, soakers that were cycling on and off at the feed bunk throughout the day, in this case, cows were just sprayed within one hour. And in this case, they actually did not have shade. If they had shade, the effects would look a bit different. So in this case, in the control treatment, you can see that body temperature is rising dramatically and that wouldn't be the case if they had shade and it would stay flatter. But um, body temperature actually began to go down within less than 15 minutes and it continued to decrease over that time period. Okay, um, thank you. Paula, do you want me to ask a question or would you like to keep going? No, please go on. Be okay, because I, I know you have to one. do, yeah, you have to do some <laughs> translating. Um, the first question that I have is, at what temperature does core body temperature decrease when a cow is exposed to heat stress? Your graph only has core body temperature flatlining as cold stress increases. Mm, sorry, can you repeat that? Um, at what temperature does core body temperature decrease when a cow is exposed to cold stress. Your graph only has core body temperature flatlining. Ah, uh, okay. I, I see. I think they're talking about the conceptual diagram towards the beginning where I lay out thermoneutrality versus core body temperature and that sort of thing. So that was deliberate. This is a conceptual diagram and I actually didn't put any units on the bottom. So even though with thermoneutrality, there is an upper and lower critical temperature within which metabolic like heat production is stable. I didn't put those temperatures there um, because that will depend on the age of the animal and other factors. So is she lactating? Is she not? That will actually affect the upper and lower critical temperature. So for young calves, their lower critical temperature is much higher because they're not producing as much metabolic heat. They have more surface area to um, mass ratio and so that's why there's no units and I also cut it off because this was from a review chapter that I wrote that was really focused on heat stress so for the purpose of this presentation in that chapter I wasn't talking about cold stress so I apologize that that information isn't there so it's not actually that it flatlines it's that the graph is cut off okay all right yes thank you and I, and I know um, yes you're right the the factors are are pretty complex in terms of cold stress, maybe more so than hot heat stress. Yeah, and I guess the take home point I wanted to make here is, again, it's, I recognize it's an incomplete figure because we're really focused on heat stress and cold stress, of course, is also important. But the take home message is that there are these critical temperatures that have been defined, which affect thermoneutrality, but then Outside of that, of course, there's also homeothermy, which is their ability to maintain their body temperature. But what my focus is on is really animal welfare. And what I want to reiterate is this concept that was defined even um, 50 years ago, which is that thermal comfort is an even narrower band. So when we're thinking about the subjective experience and well-being of the animal, they can begin to experience discomfort even before these other physiological changes and that that can also really vary from individual to individual even within the same environment and that's why it's important to try to assess at the animal level and not just draw conclusions based on cutoffs relating to ambient temperature or THI. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to start with some of the questions that I have from Marcos Neve Piera. Um, his first one is, 
do you think that um, when animals are starting to show signs of heat stress, like panting, excessive sweating, and increased respiration rate, has production and reproduction already possibly been penalized? Um, he, he's questioning um, and wants your opinion on, he's not sure if thermal discomfort starts long before the production problems appear. So where would, um, or one of these slides, did you, didn't you discuss that, that there's a difference between um, comfortable and when it starts to affect production? Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think that's actually a little bit back, uh, maybe even earlier okay. slides. I think it's maybe around um, 10 or 11. Okay, I'll start there. Yeah, maybe, maybe it's nine actually. Okay. Okay, I'm sorry, could you go back to 10? <laughs> so it's, it's actually my little tiny diagram up there in the upper um, yes. right hand corner. So again, this is unitless because it's meant to just be conceptual, but I would consider both sweating and changes in respiratory rate to be relatively early indicators. So cows do have the ability to sweat. They're not as efficient as say horses at dissipating heat in this way, but it is an evaporative heat loss mechanism. And so the principles from soaking actually are based on the same concept it's just that we're giving the cow an additional assist because their sweating rate is limited. And, and at that point when cows begin to sweat, I would say, no, you have not yet crossed that threshold into production or fertility losses. And likewise, when respiration rate begins to increase, initially that response is somewhat linear but eventually that escalates into panting. And when panting becomes severe enough, some researchers have observed that cows actually are breathing slower, but very heavily. So initially panting is associated with a high respiration rate. And the reason I brought up panting is that it's very conspicuous, but I would say once you see that, that is a severe warning sign that now heat stress is becoming serious enough that production really is at risk. And so I would say somewhere between elevated respiration rate and panting is when I would become concerned that the cow is having trouble coping, her body temperature is probably beginning to rise and milk production is threatened. Okay, yes, thank, thank you. Um, my next question from Marcos. Um, what would you recommend as cooling strategies for grazing farms in warm climates? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, that's an excellent question because a lot of these solutions are going to be regionally dependent and dependent on the production or management system. And so for grazing, I would re-emphasize that shade is the first line of defense. And I know that there has been a lot of interest in silvopastoral systems and taking advantage of natural tree cover. And that fits really in nicely with the natural history of cattle. So that shade source is something that they would seek out to take advantage of. And then in addition to that, some producers, depending on the reason, have looked into supplemental soaking either when cows come into the parlor or trying to manage that out um, on the pasture with sprinkler setups, but there is a little bit less research there. But I would say at the, at the minimum, shade is extremely helpful for preventing additional heat gain. And that's something that cows will use quite eagerly. Okay, um, so I have more questions. Paula, I don't wanna be a question hog. Do you have more that you would like to answer, ask at this point? Yes. Okay, May go I? ahead. Yes. Okay. I have uh, two questions that are related. Uh, I will read both of them. Uh, one, the first one is from Beatrice. She wonders uh, when THI exceeds the threshold that cows have shade, while we don't see cows panting, just some cows with a high respiration rates and some salivating, Mm -hmm. and Victoria asks, which is the percentage of cows with a respiration rate over 60 that indicates that the need of, a, of, a, of soak or something, mm -hmm. some heat abatement? Yeah, so in answer to the first question, actually the definition of panting depends on the researcher, but the one that I use includes the salivating, actually. So if a cow is visibly drooling or salivating, that is a sign of panting. So 
sometimes cows are breathing heavily with their mouths open or their tongues extended, but it doesn't have to be all three of those signs. And actually, if they are drooling, I would consider that panting. And if and in one study, maybe from about three years ago, they looked at the association between each of those three signs and respiration rates and found that all three, whether they occurred separately or together, were associated on average with respiration rates of about 100 breaths per minute. So it does indicate that heat stress has progressed to a point that that's a warning sign. In answer to the second question, that's a really excellent question. Unfortunately, I don't have a really good answer. We were actually trying to collect those data this summer, but because of COVID, we had to cancel our research plan. So next summer, we are conducting a study across different dairies in Wisconsin, where we'll be able to record respiration rate in every single cow in the high producing pen. And we'll be able to say then, um, what's the sample size needed to say this pen is experiencing substantial heat stress. And so right now I would say it's more of a common sense judgment. So Marian, if you wouldn't mind scrolling down, I have a graph with a bunch of little cartoon cows all over it with respiration rate. Um, yeah, it's number 27, 28, yes. And so what I'm trying, trying to illustrate here is these data were all taken from a single pen of cows just over different days. And as the ambient conditions became warmer, we saw not only more variation, so some cows were coping better than others initially, but that there were more and more with elevated respiration rates and eventually this variation again decreases. And so I would say that as soon as some cows in the pen show signs of struggling to cope, that's a warning sign that if it gets warmer, more cows are going to have that problem. So I don't have a specific number, you know, I can't say 20% or 50%, but I would say if you see at least a few cows breathing that way, I would keep an eye on them and come back in an hour or an hour and a half and see if it's more, then it's probably time to intervene because clearly the situation's getting worse, not better. But I hope to have a better answer for you next year. Uh, yes, uh, go ahead, Paula. Okay, um, th this question is from Ariel. Is it better to milk the cows at the time of the day with the highest temperature and soak them or leave them under the shade? This is in cases of a grazing herds. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, so in this case, I it's hard to say. So there was a study in New Zealand with grazing cows and they found that when they soaked the cows without shade, it reduced respiration rate and I think even body temperature more than if the cows just had shade, but the cows preferred the shade. So I think that one's tough to answer. Um, I, I would hesitate to want to remove them from the shade, especially because to milk them, they then have to walk. And that kind of physical activity increases internal body temperature, it generates body heat. So I would hesitate to recommend moving them during the hottest part of the day out of the shade in order to milk them. That would be probably my first instinct would say, let them just stay in the shade. Okay, thank, thank you. Paula, do you want me to do a few? Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, my next question, and you hit upon this a little bit. Um, I think Marcos is looking for a, a small bit of expansion. Can we effectively favor cow homeop homeothermy by genetics? Does the proportion of black or white or red hair have an impact on susceptibility to heat stress in high producing Holsteins? And what about slick hair gene or genetic selection for heat resistance? Are they effective strategies? So the short answer is yes. I know this is an area of active research. It's not um, something that I've been involved in. So in terms of coat color itself, percentage of black coat is associated with solar gain. And so in some studies with grazing cattle or with beef cattle, they have found that um, those cattle especially do need additional shade because they can gain heat faster. But within Holsteins, we actually haven't found much of an effect, at least in the US studies that I've done, where we did actually score percentage of black and white coat color on our cows. And we looked for that, how that affected their respiration rates, their body temperatures, and also their behavior. And we didn't find any associations there. Instead, it seemed to be a stronger effect just based on production level. 
but I know that there has been a lot of activity looking at slit coats or at crossbreeding and that those can have beneficial effects and I'm not sure what the latest findings have been there but I know that that is a promising area of work. I think I, I've been doing a lot of reading recently on um, just looking at the effect of environmental or uh, of climate change and what we can do to sort of ameliorate that or what we can do to be less effective and uh, it might have been Katie and Capper or Broderick possibly that had some studies that they looked at just crossbreeds and jerseys mm -hmm. as possibly being able to handle the the heat better and recommending moving away from Holsteins in some of the places where there's more mm -hmm. heat stress. Are, yeah. Do you have familiarity with that? I have heard about that and I know that a, a while back there was con some concern that um, with some of these crossbreeds you are sacrificing production level and I think that that's where this sustainability question comes into play but from an animal welfare perspective if we can make them more tolerant or more able to cope that does seem like a positive but again with the genetic selection that's outside of my direct research area so I can't speak in, in yeah I, I think that. The, the capper and Katie specifically also looked at cheddar cheddar cheese yield hmm. um, in relation so mm -hmm. that that was that was part of what they looked at hmm um, let's see Next question for you. Uh, I'm going to take one more and then see if we'll come back to Paula. Um, do you have any experience in tunnel, tunnel ventilated compost, compost bedded pack barns? And could you comment on the effect of warm bedding on heat stress, milk quality issues in a high moisture environment? Hmm. Okay, unfortunately, no. So around here, we don't have that many compost bedded pack barns. So I can't speak specifically to that. But in terms of tunnel ventilation in a freestall barn, that kind of system can be quite effective, um, just to making sure that the high speed air is moving across the cows. But with a with a compost barn, I'm not sure how much heat the bedding then contributes to the environment and how much that can be combated with the same strategy. So unfortunately, I, I can't answer that directly. Right. Um, Paula, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that there may be um, a greater prevalence of compost barns and in, in Brazil and in um, Argentina than we see around here, because I know we've talked about who we could get to speak on it. Mm -hmm. Well, I know the University yes. of Kentucky had a compost barn, and they also had um, some research recently looking into voluntary soaking with the cows. So they had the Edstrom Cool Sense at the parlor exit, but then they were also looking into putting that in an area of the pen, but I think over concrete, but I don't think that's been published yet. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, Paula, Paula said yes, they do have quite okay. a few. Okay, okay. Um, I'm going to ask one more question and then turn it back over to Paula while we're talking about um, sort of economics. If you had to make an option between either buying fans or a feed bunk low pressure sprinklers to a naturally ventilated freestyle barn, which would you spend the money on? Or would you, <laughs> and, and this is interesting, or would you buy neither if you could not have both? <laughs> so I, I think it really depends on where you are. So when I was in California, I was really focusing on soaking. But after moving to Wisconsin, I've been really pleasantly surprised at how well some cows can manage on certain farms with just the fans and so we did a study where we were looking at soaking in the parlor itself not in the holding holding pen and there were no feed line soakers and on the hotter days the cows could use that boost and i think those parlor soakers were really beneficial but a lot of times the ventilation systems in the barns were keeping the body temperatures within the normal range well enough so i was really pleasantly surprised to see that and with our current work which actually i have some preliminary results now that we obtained since I recorded the presentation, we did find a difference already in lying time. 
with just natural ventilation without the fans over the stalls and then supplemental fans providing over 300 feet per minute of air directed at cows at their lying height. We're finding a difference of about 45 minutes in additional lying time on average and we are still analyzing and digging in to the relationship with weather but we would expect on hotter days that, that difference would be even more because of the reduction in lying time we normally see in hotter weather. So at this time, I would say at least in our climate here, that those fans are extremely important, not just for cooling the cow, but for promoting lying time and mitigating that risk for lameness, which is also a serious welfare problem. So that's, I wouldn't say this is one size fits all. I don't want to prescribe this for every farm, but I have found that in some cases, fans can work fine without that soaking, but it's going to depend on the farm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, this morning, for those of you that weren't there, <laughs> um, we had Bill Prokop talked about how his experience at the Cornell Barn uh, with quite a, a considerable mile per hour wind of about, what did he say, six? Six miles per hour. Was yeah. very effective at, at cooling the cows and keeping them lying down more. So, and that was, as, as he said, it was strictly anecdotal. Um, Paula, would you like to ask a question? Yes. <laughs> yes, I'm here. Okay, so I have one question from Santiago. In, in the case, in, in a herd, we have just shade, but we can take the cows to a refreshing pen how many cycles of soaking and ventilation would be ideal for those cows? Mm, so he's talking about like a targeted cooling session outside of milking time? Or, yes. Okay. And, okay. Um, actually, I think a similar question came up this morning. And so my answer would be before doing that, I would measure the respiration rates in the cows to see if that's necessary because in taking them for a targeted cooling session that comes at the sacrifice of the rest of their time budget so with grazing cows we know they already spend less time lying down than indoor house cows which is not necessarily a bad thing because the surface they're on is also more compressible than concrete but they also have to spend so many more hours eating in order to get their daily intakes that whenever you take them away from that it gives them less time to do anything else. So before I would stop them from eating or lying down, I'd want to know, is this really necessary? And then if I did take them for a separate cooling session, what we were recommending is that en enough water is applied to substantially re reduce those respiration rates and body temperatures. The recommendations I have in, in this presentation were based on intermittent feed line soaking and not this holding pen soaking. Um, but I think that I had said something like one gallon per spray application, assuming that the spray could hit two to three cows at a time. And then you want to spray them again before their coats fully dry. So at least every 15 minutes or more frequently. But in terms of that length of the cooling session, I would want to limit that to less than an hour because we want to minimize force standing on concrete. Okay, um, Paula, do you okay, have more great. questions? Yes. Okay. Uh, this is from Daniel, which is the value of relative humidity to decide between buying sprinklers or soakers? Mm -hmm. Okay, and actually, before I get to that, I was still thinking about your previous question, and I did want to add that in a couple of other studies, which I didn't show here, we found that um, if you can only do a brief spraying session, even if you um, just spray them for about 10 or 12 minutes with a continuous spray of high volume, you know, low pressure soaking, that that can actually generate a cooling effect that lasts for maybe an hour, an hour and a half afterwards. And in New Zealand, they also found that a continuous spray not allowing for evaporation in between also kept body temperature lower for I think like four hours so it depends oh. on the climate um, so that is an option and to answer this current question um, one thing to distinguish between is the misting versus the soaking so sometimes those terms are used interchangeably so when I say sprinkling I mean the same thing as soaking but I know not everybody does and so I, I think that misting has limited effectiveness unless you live in a low 
humidity climate. So like the US Southwest or more arid regions like that, it can help. But what that does is it cools the microclimate and then the cows breathe in that cooler air. And that has limited effectiveness because in essence, you're manipulating the THI. Whereas when you soak the cow, now you're adding multiple mechanisms of cooling. So there's the evaporative cooling where the um, water is converted to vapor using energy directly from the cows body heat. And then there's also that fluid convection where the water drips off the cow in addition to cooling the microclimate. So now you have these two additional cooling mechanisms that misting doesn't provide. So I think that, you know, misting obviously uses a lot less water. So if you're in a region that has a drought, you can conserve water that way, but it has limited effectiveness. Okay, um, Paula, before you ask your yes. next one, I have one that was related. Um, this was from Marcos. He just said that the, the belief that the small droplets induce an insulating barrier, and he's amazed how that spread around the world. Was yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah <laughs> but, <laughs> is it because it started out in maybe drier climates where they thought that they were doing that. I know I used to run a greenhouse <laughs> and, and this was the way you cooled off your greenhouse was you would mist and, and you would basically yeah. create an air conditioner. And so maybe they were applying things from other industries to, you know, let's, let's put the cows in a air conditioned greenhouse. <laughs> I, I traced it back in the literature because I had heard that recommendation actually from a lot of engineers mm -hmm. as well as animal scientists where it was just getting repeated over and over but I don't think that can happen unless you actually have like a fluid film on top of that air layer so with the droplets when you have droplets landing on the end of the hairs I traced it back in the literature all the way to what the first source that I could find and all that author had said was the effectiveness is limited because then the droplets on the hair and not on the skin which means that it's converted to vapor using the heat from the environment rather than the heat from the cow. So yeah. it essentially it's, it's like microclimate cooling. So like you said, with, the, you know, spraying in a greenhouse, you're, you're reducing the air temperature in the microclimate, but you're not getting that evaporative cooling directly from the cow. But somehow I think that got lost in translation and it turned into not just that it's not as effective, but it's somehow counterproductive. But when the droplets are landing on the cow, it's not forming like a fluid barrier. It's evaporating and there's, you know, uneven coverage. So I, I don't believe in that myth and I know it keeps getting passed around, but I don't buy it. <laughs> Good. Well, thanks for elaborating on it. Paul, Paula, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry to have butted in. Go ahead. Okay, uh, the question is from Christian. He wants to know uh, if you can help us with some guidelines about diet composition to reduce heat stress. Oh boy, I wish I could, but I have to say I am not a nutritionist and that that is really, again, outside of my research area. I know there are a lot of great recommendations and actually here with um, University of Wisconsin Madison Extension, we're working on a series of fact sheets and there will be one dedicated to that particular question. So it's co-authored by some of my colleagues, including Dr. Luis Ferreretto, who just joined our department from University of Florida. And, and so I know we have a lot of great resources available, but I'm not the one with the answers there. Uh, Paula, I think I encourage mm -hmm. him to listen to our November talk. It's gonna be Marty Traxler, and I believe he's gonna talk on heat stress. Okay. <laughs> Paula, did you have more questions? No, I, I don't okay. have any more. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you Jennifer. so much. It was a pleasure. I have one more question that I'm going to ask. Um, let me find it. Uh, okay. Um, assuming the goal, and you touched on this a little bit ago with another question, the goal would be the smallest amount of water per cow per day mm -hmm. without penalizing the effectiveness on the control of heat stress. Mm -hmm. um, what would be the most efficient water usage cooling system for a naturally ventilated freestall barns in a humid region? Mm, yeah, in a humid region, that's where soaking can be really helpful because then you're really taking advantage of the evaporative and the fluid convection mechanisms since there isn't um, as much of the potential for um, 
for misters or those kinds of techniques. But it, again, it would be hard to say because we would have to do some troubleshooting. It's not one size fits all. So I think that an engineer would be able to give that farm an answer based on heat exchange. But when we're looking at cows as a biological system where they also experience animal welfare issues. If you're trying to promote comfort in the cows, you're probably going to want to intervene earlier than if you're just looking at pure heat exchange and trying to get the cow down to a, you know, a standard operating temperature. So I actually can't give a minimum amount, especially with the caveat that the research that I was doing was in a low humidity right. environment. So I, I hate to give a cop out, but yeah. I can't I can't actually give, you know, a magic number with that scenario. It's better well, than it's better than just pretending. <laughs> yeah, and and so I think that, you know, with this farm whether it's real or hypothetical, we'd have to go and do some in-person troubleshooting. It's the same thing with fans, you know, we can provide guidelines, but you have to be there to see are they angled correctly. And so with the soakers likewise, can they get away with just holding pen soaking, where they're only being soaked two or three times a day, or do they actually need soakers at the feed bunk? So that answer is going to depend on how often you spray, where you spray, and how much water you deliver at each time. So I, yeah, I don't have a magic number. Well, um, Jennifer, thank you so much. It's been, it's been a real delight working with you. Um, I don't have any more questions. I believe Paula is, is out of questions on her end. Um, Again, I, and and we had thanks from many people who attended and saying that it's a gr a topic of great interest to the global dairy industry was was Marco's parting words. So, um, <laughs> thanks so much I, for having me. It was really a fun conversation, and uh, I, I apologize that I can't always give you know a magic answer because a lot of times it's you have to look at your cows and it's the power of observation and troubleshooting. But thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Well, thank you. And yes, as as Bill said this morning, it's it's great to elevate it just from the bare minimum of cow welfare to cow care. So um, really appreciate your work that you're doing in that area. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you, Paula's for joining us. And thank you, everybody who attended. Thank and you. We'll talk to everybody next month. All right.